Um, all right. Um, good. All right. My name is uh, Jack Koenig, um, as it says on the slide. I am a software engineer at Sci5, um, and it looks like it's cut off a little bit. Sorry about that. Um, uh, but I work primarily on the Chisel and Fertile projects, um, so primarily in open source stuff. Um, and uh, I'm not, you know, primarily here to respond to, to Julius, um, I think. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm ready, I was taking notes, no, I'm just kidding. Um, no, most of the complaints that he has, like many of these things are things we're working on. Um, one in particular that I'm, I wanna highlight is uh, Async reset, so I'm actively working on that. There are open PRs that I'm badgering people to review. Um, I think the support is pretty cool. Um, it will make it really easy to describe things and be uh, completely agnostic to the type of reset if you so choose to write it that way. Um, but um, some of the other issues, you know, we can talk about over beers. They're uh, all, all many of the pain points we share. So um, working on it. But yeah, so I'm actually, this talk is primarily intended not to talk o about the overall flow, but more specifically what the concept is in writing generators and try and provide the, like talk about the mindset. Um, so I had another talk where I talked more about the flow back at ORConf in October, so you should check that out on YouTube if you're interested. Um, all right, so one of the really big themes that we're talking about here is agile hardware design. Agile is maybe a term you're familiar from the software world, but it's just the idea of um, how we can do design better. So hardware design, as pretty much everyone knows, is traditionally a waterfall. There's many years going into making chips. Um, developing new hardware is difficult, which is why you do this, right? You need to mitigate your risk, so obviously you put a lot of effort into making sure that you do a good job um, and that it works. Um, but when you develop new hardware, you have architectural design space exploration, RTL development, verification, like did we build the right thing? But I think a point that's frequently missed is validation. Did, or sorry, I said that wrong, verification, did we build the thing right? But the point that I think people frequently miss is did we build the right thing? If you spend four years getting to market, you may have completely missed your window and it may be too late for your cool widget, right? And so the point is you need to be able to operate quickly and change if the market changes as you're building your product. Um, and so the, the fundamental goal here is to attack that, that NRE cost. It costs a lot of money just in paying your engineers and in time to build a chip. Um, and this, to attack these costs, you need to be able to do design faster. Um, and to design faster, your designers need to be more productive. It's very shocking. Um, and kind of ways that you can do that is do more with less code, um, which you do by leveraging libraries. I mean, when you are writing software, nobody goes in and implements, a you know, you're not gonna go write the driver for your graphics card when you're working on a web app, right? The thing is that you're leveraging this whole stack of code underneath it. And so the goal here is to try and do the same thing in hardware. And so fundamentally, the main goal of all of this is to write reusable code. So there's a little cool picture of uh, what agile design might look like in hardware where you, you, know, you, you run quick simulations. Um, we have C++ listed here. This is a very old diagram from Chisel 2 when we had a C++ backend, but you know, Verilator turns Verilog into C++, so I still think that that's fulfilled by Verilator. Uh, as Jules said, I mean, Verilator is one of our primary targets. So, um, we do at Sci-5 and in the digital community at large a lot of uh, simulation with Verilator. You can use FPGAs, ASIC, you, you need to have your ASIC flow, right, to keep getting your timing reports back, and then you actually will tape out your chip. Okay, so what is Chisel? It stands for, although it's kind of a backronym, <laughs> constructing hardware in a Scala embedded language. The idea being that it's a domain specific language where the domain is digital design. So you are trying to d design digital chips and you can write Scala code that will let you make, um, that will let you design this hardware. It is not high level synthesis and it is, nor is it behavioral synthesis. Now I have no problems with those approaches, um, but the point is that Chisel itself has nothing to say about that. It's just the fundamental hardware primitives and allows you to connect them and um, do with them what you want. So effectively, you're writing a Scala program to construct the hardware. Um, now, Scala comes with a lot of nice things like parameterized types. It has object-oriented programming, functional programming, and static typing. And all of these are the kinds of things that help you build generators like Rocket Chip that, as Jules said, seems to work pretty well. I mean, we like it. Um, and it allows you to write code, maintain code, refactor code, and still be confident that it's gonna do the right thing. So as Chisel's embedded in Scala, the metaprogramming language and the actual hardware construction language are the same. Now this is kind of a fine point, but um, many people are familiar with generators. A lot of companies use them internally. Um, 
but frequently it'll be Python or Perl scripts that just kind of generate strings. And the problem is that frequently, if you do something wrong, you just get nonsensical Verilog, and it can be really hard to determine what went wrong. The point here is that if your chisel compiles, the Verilog should work. Now, obviously, you know, we're not gonna prove that you didn't put an and instead of an or somewhere, but fundamentally, those structural mistakes should be, should not make it to simulation. Um, and the most important point, and the point of this talk, is that it's intended as a platform upon which to build higher level abstractions. Chisel itself is not that much. There's not that much going on in it. The point is everything that you build on top of it. That's where terms like diplomacy and rocket ship come in. These are the abstractions. Um, you know, I always like to shout out because, you know, we think this approach is really cool and as do a lot of other people. Um, so the next talk is my HDL and they have similar kinds of things. Now they are more into the behavioral synthesis area, but you know, it's a similar type of be more productive by writing your hardware in Python. Um, there's also the base jump STL, which I had not heard about until this conference. I'm very excited for that talk tomorrow. And then there's many others that are not presented here to my knowledge. So if any of you are here, sorry. <laughs> but there's Spinal HDL, which is also in Scala. There's Clash and Haskell. There's a ton in Python. So you know, pick your poison. There's a lot, and a lot of them are very good. Um, Blue spec is a different approach that some of you may be familiar with. Genesis 2 is kind of that more traditional like stringly Perl stuff. And then Kami is a really cool one that um, we are also working on at Sci-5 where it's not just that your hardware is provably correct, but your entire generator is as well. So that's a pretty neat approach, but I, don't, I know very little about that. That's a bit beyond me. <laughs> um, all right, so um, let's look at some basic chisel. Uh, this is the example you'll see on the website. And um, you know, there's nothing here that's that surprising. I mean, you can create modules which are obviously organizational structures just like they are in Verilog. You have your interface which has you know, bit vector inputs and booleans and outputs and you have registers. There's a couple 32-bit registers here. Um, and you look at this and you notice it looks very similar to Verilog, right? Um, and that's really not the point. <laughs> but the idea here is that there's nothing crazy going on. Like you can transliterate your Verilog to chisel. Um, I've heard of people apparently, although I don't know how much, like none of this is like open source stuff unfortunately, but people have transpiled Verilog to chisel and then run it through and use lec and show that it's the same and then you can start iterating on it. Um, we haven't done anything like that. That would be cool if someone wanted to build that tool, but, um, but that's basically it. So now everyone here knows chisel. You, you saw the example and um, <laughs> we're done. <laughs> but of course not. Um, <laughs> Like I said, it's intended as a platform upon which to build higher level abstractions. So that's what I'm gonna talk about here. As Jules kind of alluded to, Rocketship is chock full of them. We've got diplomacy, the register router, bus blocker, FIFO fixer, cache cork, user yanker. Um, <laughs> I didn't do any of these names, but uh, some of those are my favorites. Um, but let's pick a relatively simple abstraction and see where we can go with it. So prefix sum is uh, something that Many of us are familiar with. Does anyone know what time I started, by the way? I'm actually right at 11. Okay. Um, so prefix sum is the sum of like running running totals of a, of you know sequence of numbers, right? Um, this is something pretty much everyone's familiar with. Uh, just to walk through it really quickly, if this is a sequence of numbers, you know the first one you just take directly, and then you add it to the second one and get a sum. You take that sum and add it. Blah blah blah. Very exciting. Spent way too long on that animation for probably no gain. Um, <laughs> But the idea just being, you know, this is a simple algorithm that has a lot of applications. And if you take that previous diagram and kind of stretch it out, right? Like here I kind of draw it with little arrows, but what if we just like pull it down and represent the time steps temporally or, you know, graphically as we go down the page, right? So we can create a diagram like this. This is a different view of what a prefix sum looks like. And this is also called a ripple prefix sum, and this probably looks familiar to you. Um, this is the naive implementation, and it looks kind of like hardware. It quacks kind of like hardware. And to absolutely no one's surprise, this is essentially a ripple carry adder, right, that we all know from intro to digital design. And to be a little more precise, it's a generalization of a ripple carry adder because prefix sum, while it has sum in the name because that's the basic example, um, it can apply to any associative operator. So think about that plus as just any associative function that you want to apply to the inputs. So now, because we're building abstractions, let's define an interface. So here's a little bit of Scala. Um, one thing I want you to note over these next few slides, there is no chisel in this code. This is just pure Scala. Um, so this uh, is a trait, which is like an interface in any language um, that is going to define what a prefix sum can be expressed as. 
So in this case, it has a function called apply. Apply is just a special function in Scala where if you put parentheses after an object, it's calling the method called apply. That little t there is a type parameterization, which means whatever, we don't specialize this function, it's general. So it can work on any t, any type. Um, and so what we do is we pass it a sequence of sum ends, the things we're gonna sum or prefix sum across, and then some associative operator. And so that syntax there that may look a little funny to anyone who uh, does not have, I guess you can't see my mouse, aha, you can't see my mouse. Um, pointer, cool. This part right here <laughs> is, um, may look a little funny, but in Scala, I mentioned functional programming. Functions are first class citizens. You can treat them like any value. So this is saying that it takes a function of two t's that returns a t. So if you think about addition, that is a function that takes two integers and returns an integer, right? Um, any associative operator. So um, if we go to the next slide, so here's an implementation of a ripple prefix sum. Um, probably, it's not too complicated. I know code on screens is never that fun, but the basic idea here is we're implementing that apply method I mentioned. Um, and uh, because this is Scala and we like functional programming, we like to write things recursively instead of iteratively, but it's the same kind of thing that you can express in any language. We have a helper function, which is what we recurse across, and the recursion here is just for every layer of the prefix sum. So if you remember that slide I showed earlier with the prefix sum going down the screen, it's kind of like every single time you saw a plus, that's we're calling helper once, each, like, uh, each layer of the, of the sum. And so all this does is it will, it, you know, for, it walks all the layers, and every time it checks, it increments the i, and the, which is the, the index into the sum ends that we're looking at. And then if i equals the current offset, it will plop down that associative operator. And that's all it does. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Um, you can look at this code later if you're interested in it. Um, but that's how it works. So, you know, can we do better than a ripple prefix sum? Well, you know, obviously we can because I asked. Um, and boom, that is a diagram of a dense prefix sum. And, you know, you can kind of see it. That's a 16 bit, although I think it's going off the screen, prefix sum. And what this does is, as we all know, a ripple. Uh, some would take 16 steps. In this case, you can see it only takes, you know, log two of 16 and takes four. And that's pretty sweet. Um, this is called the dense prefix sum. Has far fewer levels of logic at the cost of area, because you can see there's a lot more adders here, a lot more of that operation. It's in log in area uh, at log in depth, okay? So does this look familiar? This probably looks familiar to some people. This is a hardware conference, of course. Um, and this is, and I'm, I don't actually know how to say this name, so I'm gonna just try Kogi Stone, maybe? Kogi? Kogi? Something? Anyway, call, call it a Kogi Stone adder. So it, um, if, if you've taken a digital or advanced digital design class, you may have seen this diagram. This is the one straight from Wikipedia. Um, and what's really cool about these styles of adders is that they allow you to um, calculate uh, carries, they're called carry look-ahead adders, and they allow you to calculate the carry in parallel while you're computing the sum at individual steps. And so this is a very interesting algorithm. It's very cool. I recommend checking it out. Um, I had fun making these slides because I decided to implement it. So first, we have a dense prefix sum implementation, and that might look a little familiar. Huh. That's very similar. And so here I've marked what the actual differences are from the ripple prefix sum, but the idea here is Instead of only plopping down your operator at the offset, you plop it down for any index less than the offset. And instead of incrementing the offset one by one, you are left shifting it or multiplying it by two, and that's where you get your log two depth. And so this, implement, this is an implementation of a dense prefix sum, and so now let's make an adder. So here we're gonna implement a Kogi Stone adder. Um, it has the interface, you know, adds two numbers and returns a number of width, width greater one bit greater. And so to take that legend back, um, we are just going to naively implement it straight from Wikipedia. So here I have the little red squares that were at the top and we, we have um, propagate and generate bits. We will XOR each index to get the propagate and we'll AND them to get the generate. And you can see I have that written there. Zip is just a way of taking two sequences, combining them in such a way that you can iterate on them together. So. I zip the A's and the B's together, the bits from each one, and then I apply a function to it, because this is functional programming, and that function I'm mapping, and, and I apply that to every single one. 
And so what we get out of that are those red boxes. These pairs are the propagate and generates um, as represented by those red boxes. Okay, now for the next bit, recall that the function that prefix sum, the interface prefix sum defines is you give it some sum ends and you give it an associative operator. That's it. So that's what we do here. We give, where's my mouse? There it is. We're calling dense prefix sum because that's what the Kogi Stone adder uses. We pass it those pairs, which were the outputs of these red boxes, and we're implementing this entire middle zone here um, of the, the, um, the prefix uh, the propagation and generation carry bit calculation, and I'm doing it naively from the slide. I have pi and pi prev, so here's p prev, g prev, um, pi, gi, right? And this is this little case here that you see. This is the function that we're passing to the prefix sum that it will use to calculate the propagate and generate bits. And so, if you look here, I just literally took and I implemented p, and I took and I implemented g exactly from the diagram on Wikipedia. And then now for the last bit, and this part I got wrong because the diagram is misleading. <laughs> um, it says here, let me get the red box, that CI is GI, which is the last generate bit, and then it says SI is PI XOR CI minus one. The thing that it didn't tell you, and you had to go into the text to figure out, was that that PI is referring to the PI from the red box. So it kind of has to pass all the way from the beginning. So that took me a little while to get right, but basically I'm, again, naively implementing it straight from the diagram. I have this XOR right here, there's the PI XOR CI, and then all that I'm doing here is I need to create the, car this, the carries, which are those generate bits. This is getting the second field from the tuples, and I need to add a carry in, so that's where that false comes in. And then for the, the propagates, I need to have one for the overflow as well, because we need to have an extra bit. And just like that, um, we've made a Kogi Stone adder. And the thing is that this is parameterized for any width, any width greater than zero. I don't actually, it might actually work with zero too, but I don't see that being useful. Um, so abstraction, it's pretty cool. But can we do more reefs? Um, obviously, we can, because I asked. Um, and so now I'm gonna you know, briefly mention a sparse prefix sum as I'm, I still have a few more minutes. Uh, so this is the diagram of that one, a little less intimidating than uh, the dense prefix sum. Um, this is also straight from Wikipedia, and uh, what's neat about this is it's um, much less logic than dense, yet still a lot faster than a ripple, uh, ripple carry. Sorry, much less area, but somewhat deeper logic. So it's 2n area, whereas um, ripple is n, and dense is n log n. Um, 2 log n depth, so a little bit deeper than the, the dense. Um, and we can implement this in Chisel as well. It's a little more complicated. It wouldn't fit well on a slide, but I will have it in a Git repo. And it's also on Rocketship. Um, and um, it's not too bad. So now, instead of having that Kogi Stone adder that uses the dense prefix sum, what if I take that section that I had before, so previously I had dense right here, and I replace it and take that as an argument. So now I can abstract across the type of the prefix sum that I'm going to apply. Well, you know what, it works. And so I've made a ripple carry adder. Obviously, this is a very complicated way to make a ripple carry adder, but the Verilog is basically identical to doing it that way. Uh, I can make the same Kogi Stone adder, and I can even make, I'm 95% sure what is a Brent Kung adder, <laughs> um, although um, I, I was having trouble getting into some of the technical details. But if you use a sparse prefix sum, you also get a working adder that uses somewhat less area and yet still runs pretty fast. And so that's pretty cool. I have one implementation of a fast prefix sum adder, and I can apply all these different techniques to it to make them different. Now, importantly, the point of this is it's not about the adders. <laughs> like, no one, like, almost no one is implementing adders anymore. Some people do, and they make some pretty great advances, but almost everyone in this room just uses plus, right? And it turns out that the tools will usually do a better job than you. But the point is that we can create these abstractions and then apply them across a lot of different things. And so this is from uh, guy Blalock, um, who's a professor at CMU and I think the guy of prefix sums, and he has a paper uh, where he talked about all these different things that you could do. Now this is from a software perspective, but you know, lexically comparing strings of characters is not something that many people are doing in hardware, but maybe they should. I mean, how much of our code is just jitting JavaScript, right? Um, you know, a ton of it. So we are in this new world where we have way too many transistors and not enough power to power them all. So who knows what of these applications we can implement accelerators for. And the thing is that it's pretty easy to express when you have the right types of abstractions. Um, 
and so yeah, that's it. it. Looks like I managed to hit 20 on the money, so pretty good. Um, please find us on GitHub, and uh, if you want to learn Chisel, we have the boot camp. It's kind of neat. If it's not good enough, tell us, and we'll improve it. Um, we um, yeah, uh, I'm also here. You know, I'm here mainly in, in capacity as open source, but like I said, I work at Sci5. We use Chisel. We like it. We have a lot of open source stuff as well, and uh, we have a demo of you know the High Five Unleashed, which is Rocket core, multi-core rocket core running um, Debian on, you know, real RISC-V silicon. Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. Questions? I'm a big fan of type functional programming and also have some knowledge of hardware design. Um, I still find it hard to connect the two concepts. Um, and, and I have reason to believe I'm not the only one. Is there some collection, some kind of petting zoo of, of um, abstractions expressed as chisel and also like their, um, their regular hardware representation that some of us may be more familiar with? Some other ways to basically connect those two concepts in your head? Yeah, um, there's, there's not to the extent that there should be. I mean, most of the examples we have are fairly small. The, the boot camp is the best place to look for those because um, a lot of the work into that has been being done by some DSP people. And so they implement, you know, some normal DSP things like filters and things and show how you express that in Chisel. Um, but yes, I think that would be a useful thing is more examples that just show exactly how you would write it in Verilog. Um, part of my fear in doing that myself is that I'm not very good at Verilog, and I'm even worse now than I was when I started writing Chisel. Um, but so I, I always am, I'm always a bit hesitant to you know accidentally straw man what people would write who are much better at, at Verilog and System Verilog than I am. But I do think that that would be a really useful exercise across all of the similar types of things to Chisel, all all the languages um, su such as Zoo should exist. So I'm new to Chisel. I'm just wondering uh, who the official maintainer of, of Chisel is. Uh, I, I, is it Sci-Fi? Is it Berkeley? Uh, yeah, so that's um, one of the things that is currently in process. We're working on the, what the governance structure should look like. Um, but you know, it was originally just Berkeley, and I came from Berkeley. But now it's really the maintenance is distributed between Berkeley, sci five, and uh, we have one maintainer um, as well who's completely external to both. And we're, you know, trying to continue to grow the community. This is this is bigger than than Berkeley or Sci Five, and we hope that it it continues to grow that way. Um, so I've heard some people before talking about using uh, Rocket and saying that there can be a bit of a, an imbalance between some designers uh, of pieces of Rocket will lean more heavily in the object oriented. Uh, abstractions and others will lean more heavily in the functional abstractions. I was wondering kind of like what your thoughts are on this. Uh, how, yeah. how does this come about? How do you deal with it and so on? Yeah. Yeah, so this is, um, you know, for those who are more into the, like, the, the, the software kinds of things, this is one of the interesting compromises of Scala. So there are very few languages that are as multi-paradigm as Scala because it is full bore functional and also full bore object oriented and those do conflict at, at times. Um, so, you know, basically, you know, Chisel obviously has no opinion on this, uh, and it's in, in Ch Scala, which doesn't have too much of an opinion. So, my opinion, I prefer functional programming. I think it's, it's, I think it's more composable and easier to maintain, but um, other people disagree. And so, I mean, I think it's just a matter of practice and a matter of who's reviewing your code and if they'll accept it or not. Uh, Maybe not the best answer. Maybe a, a, a beer or two will make that answer more interesting. <laughs> One over here. I guess I'm pretty new to all of uh, these new types of languages outside of Verilog and System Verilog. Is there any effort to not have to go to Verilog first before you go into the tools? Like, what's what's the path forward there for Chisel so you can avoid yeah. Verilog completely? So we, I didn't talk about it in this talk very much, but we have our own IR Fertile. Um, so Chisel is really kind of a lean front end on Fertile um, that it kind of elaborates a hardware graph represented in Fertile, and then Fertile gets compiled down to Verilog. We would love to not go through Verilog because it is a huge pain to me when I have to fix little things about our Verilog emission. 
oh, like here's a fun one that I, I, uh, I really hate. Um, I should link to this on GitHub. <laughs> so when I was implementing async reset, um, I you know, did a normal thing and I, you, know, you can group your always blocks based on if you share a reset and share a clock, then you can have the same always block. And I did that and I admitted it that way because I thought that's what people would like. And that's what most of the tools like, except some of them wouldn't accept it. Including tools from the same vendors, so you pay a lot of money. Two different tools like, would not agree on it. And so I had to emit one always block per asynchronous reset. And it's like, amazing, it's baffling to me. And so yes, if we could do an IR, um, I like Fertile, I think it's a good choice. There are many others, I think um, another one will be presented here. And um, whatever the case is, um, that would be great. And I know people like Olaf ha have a lot of interest in this and are talking about it and trying to convince, you know, try and convince people to implement and accept the IR directly. I think that would be fantastic though. Is there a simulation infrastructure that, do, uh, I guess so, we go to Verilog for uh, synthesis also. Is there a plan for a simulation infrastructure directly on Fertile or, mm -hmm. or for coverage directly on uh, Gala code? Yeah, great question. So we do have a Fertile interpreter. Um, and well, I guess we have two. There's, there's, there's an older one and then there's a faster one now. That is, so it's a Scala-based interpreter. Um, so you can use that. It's called Fertile Terp, I think. And then um, as for like, different types of coverage metrics. Yes, we, we need a better coverage library. Currently we just use like immediate cover points on our, and you know, it's nice because you're writing Scala so you can generate them really easily. But that doesn't map very well to what vendor tools want. And we get lots of warnings like, you have 32,000 cover points in this module. Is that really what you want? It's like, well, yeah, kinda. So, um, you know, better ways to express coverage and that way would be helpful. When it comes to actual coverage of the Scala code, that's kind of like a different metric. That's like a metric of the coverage of your generator. Um, and that's an interesting thought. We haven't really done much of that. We just kind of generate the parameterizations that, and for the record, a lot of parameterizations, but the parameterizations that are interesting to us or that people are trying to buy. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's hopefully a sufficient answer. Yeah, thank you. Cool, I think that'll have to be it. Um, Thanks, Jack. All right, pretty much. Cheers. Thank you.